Thank you, Daniel. Thank you for inviting me and having me here. Um, my apologies, my talk will also be um, in English. My children who are fluently bilingual always say, don't try, Mom. No one will understand you. Um, so, uh, now, I don't, although I don't have PowerPoint, I, I, I do love technology. I was one of the first people in my social circle to have a smartphone. Um, I'm also really cheap, though, so I haven't upgraded this in some time. It's an iPhone 4, if you wow. think of it, you know. Um, it, but, you know, I, I, some people are actually like, wow. <laughs> um, and I haven't bothered to upgrade my operating system in some time. So when I did it recently, um, I noticed that there was this new app that was installed on my phone by, by Apple, one that I couldn't delete, Apple Health. Right? And so it was a great interest that I took a look at this and, and, and opened it. And I found all sorts of possibilities for filling in health information, um, many of which really, I have to admit, surprised me quite a bit. So under reproductive health, if you've ever taken a look at it, there are places to enter information like cervical mucus quality and your sexual activity, right, on your phone. This makes me feel old. Um, <laughs> sleep analysis, right, where it tells me that the sleep trackers, if I should choose to, to um, attach them, can monitor the amount of time I, I spend to sleep various settings where you can set up permissions to share this data with other apps or import this data from other sources like all the trackers um, that are available. A lot of this information that, that there are categories for is just very intensely private on its face. But, right, Apple Health is a place where you aggregate all this data and that data once aggregated centrally um, leads to all sorts of inferences <laughs> that can be made. Sleep trackers and heart rate monitors can reveal details of sexual activity, for example. Cell phones are already location trackers. Um, so these, these centralized personal data stores, right, bring everything together and they're meant to be connected to um, various devices, right, that can sense things about you, your Fitbit, Apple Watch is another one. There are a whole bunch of these really interesting trackers. I know you've talked about this already a bit. One that really struck me, although I don't know that you can, um, it, it works with Apple. There's something called a feel tracker where it's this wristband um, and it, it measures a variety of biosensors in order to basically automatically track your emotions during the day is the claim. Um, so there's all this, this part of the grand sort of datafication of the self. And it's also Apple Health as this kind of aggregator is also meant to connect with other apps that themselves are increasingly going in the direction, um, as, as Helen showed us, that not just helping you to keep track of information, right? They're not just an information repository, but helping you to make sense of this information. And so the apps are trying to have a kind of intelligence, right, to help you understand the information that you're tracking. So for example, this feel mood tracker um, helps you, quote, and this is what it says, helps you understand how you felt, where you felt it, what you were doing, and with whom. It's very interesting, you know, I keep thinking about that. Imagine wearing that in the office, <laughs> having that connected to my calendar. It's like, hmm, this kind of, you know, faculty meetings <laughs> always seem to be, co you know, coordinated with irritation. <laughs> okay. Um, <laughs> Uh, other ones, like Glow is an ovulation calculator that purports to offer personalized reproductive health and fertility insights. Um, so right, they're trying to help you um, understand certain things. Now, I don't know how these um, apps in particular work, um, and I, I love some of this research that's going on that are trying to um, unpack these flows, but the minute um, they start to talk about having personalized insights, right? Delivering you personalized insights. I think, well, there's a number of things at issue, right? Big data being one of them. Either the app has access to some kind of data already, or it's collecting the data of users, or both, because it has to run analytics, right? Even if it's just to, um, uh, as Helen was saying, indicate where you stand in relation to other people in order to deliver those insights to you. Um, and this raises questions about also machine learning, right, as the trend for data analytics. Um, and cloud computing, which again, I think um, Helen's data flow is really useful to show. Often the information from your app is backed up to the cloud. And now, in fact, many of the large tech firms are embracing cloud-based artificial intelligence. So what they're trying to do is create these cloud-based platforms that allow <coughs> smaller developers, like apps, access the technology of AI to build it into their products. Okay. 
So, you know, all of this together is not just sort of the <laughs> space, but it's kind of very um, uh, uh, compelling in that space. I think shows us how we can no longer talk about things like digital privacy or the internet or the cloud, as if these are somehow separate from kind of our embodied terrestrial lives, right? Um, and in some of the work I'm doing right now, I call this uh, the, the informational fifth dimension. So the idea is we have three-dimensional space, we have the fourth dimension of time, but we now have this informational fifth dimension. So the idea is that alongside these other four dimensions we're already used to um, uh, living within and navigating, we've added this other dimension that changes our experience of the four dimensions we're normally used to living with, oftentimes warping and modulating our experience of um, space and time. It shifts the environment within we, which we interact. And one might say, given this um, environment, that it's taking us very far afield from some of the traditional concerns of information privacy, at least some of those expressed through um, data protection law. So, Data protection law, which is the model for a lot of health privacy um, legislation, is, is often associated with an idea of control over personal information, right? So you tell me what you want to do with my information, I consent, your use and disclosure has to conform to those original purposes to which I consented. And as we've already heard, um, uh, 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 Vincent uh, raised this quite nicely, the consent model is under considerable strain. And once we add wearables to this, it just exacerbates it, right? Privacy policies are already problematic um, and give, I think, illusory protection, but they're not going to apply very well with wearables because there's no, there's no place for the, even the pop-up window for I agree, right, where we all click through without reading. Um, it's just kind of gone. Um, and I think that the other thing is that people interact with things, right, with a certain set of expectations, but we don't really understand um, the, the informational dimension of these things as we move towards the Internet of Things. You don't understand that this is software collecting and transmitting information. So you might have heard about this new class action lawsuit against a Canadian company called Standard Innovation. They're the makers of, of WeVi, which is a sex toy, it's a vibrator. So apparently you can download an app onto your phone that allows you to control it remotely. And a number of people who purchased this um, <laughs> just thought, well, you know, I have two devices talking to one another. To their great horror and surprise, it turned out actually that, right, the app was transmitting that data to, right, the makers of the app onto their servers in Canada. And now there's a bunch of people in the U.S. who have launched a class action suit about that. And I think it shows a number of things, which is, you know, the way our expectations with respect to how we interact with things, we need to understand there's this informational dimension. But also when we interact with the cloud, we think the cloud's out there, and the cloud too is a bunch of things, servers that are located in particular locations and can be in other jurisdictions, right? And so we need to understand how that kind of, the, the, what I call the fourth dimensional world works with this informational dimensional world. Um, so the, the other thing is that the, this, I think the idea of control over personal information, which gets us this kind of consent model that's now under considerable strain, um, if not just breaking, um, is also kind of limited. So Alan Weston, in his influential book, Privacy and Freedom, argued that it's up to the individual to negotiate a balance between sort of withdrawal and disclosure. So control, the individual control is the way in which we um, negotiate this boundary between withdrawing and disclosing. And there's something very helpful about that when we think about communications, because communications, okay, you know, who are you going to disclose information to? But with the, I think with the set of health apps and sensors that, that, that I've been describing here, it's not really that you're choosing between withdrawal and disclosure, because I think the information flows at issue here are in service of, of self-knowledge, not self-disclosure. <coughs> Right? According to one of the promo videos for Apple Health, when you know your health better, you now know yourself better. Um, but withdrawal seems like a strange way to sort of describe this. Um, and and it, it, one of the, the reasons why it's strange is it's still very interactive. It's just kind of weirdly impersonal, right? You want sensors to collect information about you, but not people. Right? You want analytics done on this, but not necessarily for anyone to know. 
And then there's this great pressure to share that, that Helen was talking about. Um, so one of the things I favor in, in terms of thinking about um, privacy is the language of, of self-presentation rather than individual control. So the idea is privacy norms protect conditions for self-presentation, which is our ability to choose what kind of self we present to other people. So it's very rooted in ideas of identity um, and social identity. Um, and, and one of the things that, I mean, this, I draw a lot on the work from Urban Goffman, and one of the things he argues is that there's a backstage to this presentation where we get ready, right? It can be a very social backstage, it's not really about withdrawal, because it can be very relational and social. But in relation to a particular audience, right, you have some, some protected space where you're trying to um, you know, figure out who you are and who you want to be in relation to some other audience. So this idea of the backstage, and I think what some of this um, uh, technology is, is pointing to is how do we protect the integrity of the backstage? I think there's some really basic things that, that we need to emphasize a lot more. Security. Right? We talk a lot in the privacy space when we're talking about digital privacy, about consent, um, and security kind of takes a backstage. It's for you know people who have a specialized knowledge and whatnot. But but security becomes really really of central importance when you have so much data moving between all of these different points. All those different points create important points of vulnerability, um, and you're talking about incredibly sensitive information and, and often. Um, and so there's lots of concerns about hacking, um, lots of concerns about, about security. And then I worry about the distributive effects of this because it's the larger companies that can afford better security um, and also produce more expensive products. And so what does that mean in terms of people's ability to actually um, uh, take uh, 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 advantage of some of the beneficial effects of this in a, a properly secured environment? Um, how are we going to manage that? Um, and I think there's also a, a number of things we need to think about about what I consider the shifting nature of, of this backstage, as I'm calling. So it used to be we thought of these backstage places as private places, like homes or special confidential re relationships that you could trust in. You can see this in the case of health knowledge. So knowledge of your health used to be a kind of journey of self-discovery that your doctor accompanied you on. Right? Even if my doctor orders tests, sends me to specialists, there's a sense in which all that information remained protected within a circle of care, within particular physical places, like hospitals and clinics, where it was secured by both technology, law, and social and professional norms, and where some professional caregiver is your interpreter. But now, in some of this space, this, we're engaged in self-discovery in relation to a much broader type of information, so this broader move towards wellness, right, which encompasses quite a lot, um, rather than illness. Um, but also, I think even more importantly, in the context of commercial imperatives, right? There's money involved in producing trackers. There's money involved in aggregating this information. Um, and so there are these uh, set of trends, right, where it's self-knowledge, but it's in this context of a kind of competitive self-optimization according to a certain set of matrix. Um, and it's in um, a, a context of commerce rather than care. I think that there are a lot of issues there. There are issues related to identity and self-knowledge, but I'm not sure the language of privacy is going to help us with all of that. I think we need a sort of broader set of, of values to talk about there. Um, and, you know, when I was, I was thinking a lot about it, I was really uh, uh, taken with this, this feel mood track, right? This idea that they could track your emotions all day and help you understand how you felt, where you felt, it, what you were doing, and, and with whom. Now imagine a world of ubiquitous sensors like this, right? If we just sort of expand, say this is the world that, that we're coming into. Um, Murai Hildenbrand is a, a, a theorist who has a great example at the beginning of a, a really fantastic book called Smart Technologies, where you can say, imagine that I had some kind of automated assistant, right, that can track my moods and emotions, structure my day in a manner that will um, ensure optimal productivity, might be able to anticipate, right, where I might run into someone who makes me anxious and arrange my schedule to avoid that. You know, I might be attracted to that, right? I might sign up for that. Um, now this, right, once you move into this, you're no longer even talking about self-knowledge, right? But you have this kind of sensory-rich environment that has itself a sort of active intelligence anticipating my reactions and intervening in ways that seek to optimize those actions and reactions. 
And the flip side of this is that others are interacting with me on the basis of judgments that come to be based on predictions that are themselves generated by this data-rich world. Now, I think a lot of this too changes our conditions of self-presentation, although again, I'm not so sure that privacy is a very helpful way of thinking about that. Um, so you know, self-presentation requires knowledge of audience as one of its basic prerequisites, and I think audience segregation is one of the things that many of our privacy norms do very well. But self-presentation also requires enough knowledge to anticipate audience reactions. If you can't anticipate the reaction of others, um, then this is really problematic, right? You don't know how to act in a particular context if you don't know what the reaction is potentially likely to be. Usually, our ability to anticipate comes from social knowledge, right? You understand people generally, you understand social contexts, you understand social cues, you understand social roles. Maybe not perfectly, but there's a kind of basic notion of understanding there that makes it a you able to negotiate um, uh, the, your way in the world, so to speak. Um, but there's a serious question of whether we can actually anticipate the reactions of others in a world when others are engaging with us through this kind of data-rich interface, or not even human, right? They might just be sort of AI. Um, and sometimes the reactions of others are on the basis of reputational judgments being made on the basis of data analytics that remain opaque to ordinary um, individuals. So I can't actually anticipate how you will judge me because I don't understand what you're using to create the reputational judgment um, based on what I'm doing. Like, so there becomes this real opaqueness in interactions. Um, and I think we need to start thinking about how to deal with that. I'm not sure that the language of privacy is so helpful there. Um, but certainly notions of um, transparency um, will become important. And transparency, we're, we're used to thinking about connected to consent, right? So knowledge and consent, informed consent. We think that the consent moment is where transparency is so important. But I think as we shift and understand that consent is not super pr protective generally, it's definitely not very protective in this kind of a context, we probably have to bring in other sorts of norms and values um, somehow um, into our thinking, but we still need transparency because without that, we can't really get at even say mapping an information flow to start understanding what some of those norms should be. So we need to decouple right our, our notions of transparency from consent and start thinking about how to build it in more generally so that we can kind of move towards this other, more richer set of values, I think, that we have to bring to bear um, in this brave new world. Thank you.